It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I, over the last few months, I've had uh, made wonderful acquaintances with um, people here, and, and that's been a, a, an exciting thing to do. Uh, and it's my um, involvement with the New Materialism Cluster that's brought me here, but it's a long-standing passion. So I must make sure I keep to the time and um, go. So, uh, my paper title, Irresistible Matters, Expansive Forces and Material Performativity. So I begin. Whilst an image is conceived merely as a sign in the world, we remain perfectly safe. However, should we begin to talk about the performative image of the power, uh, power of the image, about force and effect, the task facing the artist begins to shift and we are no longer safe. In turning to the question of what pictures do, rather than merely what they mean, I propose to shift the locus of discussion from the picture as object and a signifying system to the event of picturing. In such an event, there is, according to Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, a summoning forth in which, and I quote, the invisible forces of gravi gravity, heaviness, rotation, the vortex, explosion, expansion, germination and time make perceptible the imperceptible forces that populate the world. These forces, they argue, are not just glimpsed, but actually affect our becoming. This paper offers a visual argument, and I think the idea of a visual argument is a really important one, that if we're going to be able to argue, that we can argue, if we're visual artists, if we can argue visually, it seems to me a logical thing to do. But, so it offers a visual argument for the picturing of, uh, performativity of picturing. Through addressing the dynamism of material in which c colour vibrates and shimmers, textures rub and bruise, lines quiver and shapes, push and shove and topple over, the paper aims to demonstrate the expansive force that undoes representation and creates something unimaginable yet precisely true to life. By true to life, I do not mean our everyday experience of the world. True to life is the athleticism, the vital forces under experience. The paper proposes that figured performatively, picturing is not about representing or reproducing forms, but rather is concerned with invoking the imperceptible forces beneath perception. The forces operating in an image undo the image and produce something true to life. The paper proceeds in three movements. Firstly, it lays out a plane of composition. Secondly, uh, sorry. Secondly, it charts a confrontation with forces through which the image becomes an intensive reality. And finally, it invokes the, Rob the ghost of Robert, Wells mother Robert Motherwell's elegies to a Spanish Republic in a series of figurative drawings, black with no way out after Motherwell, and elegy to an Oz Republic after elegy, after Motherwell. Here I propose that the task of working with Motherwell's compositions is not just technical, nor is it merely to invoke the name and history of Robert Motherwell. It is concerned with attending to the forces which are in, unleashed in and through the work and demonstrate how they come to bear on us. But firstly, I want to begin with a plane of composition. And for some of you, there's a, a part in here where I actually, it may have some familiarity. But I want to set up the argument for, for where I'm going. So, 4.33. In 1952, John Cage staged the first performance of his composition, Four Minutes 33, at Maverick Concert Hall in New York. In this first performance, the pianist David Tudor entered into the stage armed with a stopwatch, sat down at the table, placed the score on it, and lowered the, lowered the lid of the piano. During the next four minutes and 33 seconds, Tudor lowered and raised the piano lid at prescribed intervals and turned, turned the pages of the score to mark the three moments of the composition. At the conclusion of the performance, he raised the piano lid and left the stage. Despite the opinions of many in the seated audience, 
This performance was not merely nothing, nor was it just the chaos of the everyday. By creating a frame of four minutes and 33 seconds, Cage laid out a plan, plan of composition. In What is Philosophy, Deleuze and Guattari argue that art's role is to confront chaos, to throw a net over it and create a plane of composition. In their thinking, what is not composed is not a work of art. Their conception of an aesthetic plane of composition, however, is not technical composition. That is, the relationship between content and form. They are adamant the, that the work of art is never produced by or for the sake of technique. Further, in contrast to much contemporary thinking on art that posits artworks as text to be decoded and read, Deleuze and Guattari don't believe that art is concerned with communication, and whilst it might be concerned with expression, it is not the expression of an artist's intention. On this point, thought, on this point contemporary thought would seem to be in agreement, although perhaps Michael Fried and Ruth Lays would disagree. In their thought, this is Deleuze and Guattari's, it is the material that becomes expressive, not the artist. Thus, according to this materialist ontology, it is not the artist who creates sensations. It is the oil smiling, the metal thrusting, the stone crouching, and the clay gesturing. What do Deleuze and Guattari mean when they invoke the call to cast out a net over chaos and lay out a plane of composition? In the visual arts, we are, we are familiar with the notion of the picture plane. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Right, okay. That was well done. Thank you. Okay. Okay, what do Deleuze and Guattari mean when they invoke the call to cast out a net over chaos and lay out a plane of composition? In the visual arts, we are uh, particularly us, uh, two-dimensional artists. We are familiar with the notion of the picture plane, the two-dimensional surface on which shapes, lines, marks and colour patches are organised into a composition. For Deleuze and Guattari, the plane, whether it be the plane of imminence in philosophy, the plane of reference in science or the plane of composition in art is not an actual composition. Whilst the plane of composition is a virtual containing infinite possibilities, we may understand composition, the word composition, as a particular event or assemblage on the plane of composition. It is through the interconnection of events occurring at different speeds and intensities that an assemblage on the plane of composition is constructed. Each performance is an event through which different con connections and syntheses are made. Let's see if I can do it at the right time. From Matisse, we have learned how a composition is becoming expressive. We may begin a painting by marking the surface, laying down patches of color, rubbing back and remarking. As soon as a mark is made or a color patch is laid down, even an accidental marking of the canvas, a tension is created between the colour and the space around, between mark and edge, between shape and shape. A second mark or patch of colour creates a new dynamism, overtaking the impulse and so on. Drawing from an infinite possibility of, of work, so, sorry, drawing from an infinite possibility, the work of art proceeds to make connections and build these connections into plane. However, as with Cage's 4 minutes 33, this process does not go on willy-nilly. Matisse observes, and I quote, there is an impelling proportion of tones that may lead me to change the shape of figure figuration or to transform my composition. Until I have achieved this proportion in all parts of a composition, I strive towards it and keep on working. Then a moment comes when all the parts have found their definite relationships and from then on it would be impossible for me to add a stroke to my picture without having to repaint it entirely. Here Matisse recognises the tenuousness of the event of painting. With one more stroke, a painting may unravel and return to chaos. 
The work of art is to create the finite, what we call the artwork, in a way that does not tie it to representation, but instead enables possibilities and restores the infinite. According to Deleuze and Guattari, art lays out a plane of composition that in turn, through the action of aesthetic figures, bears monuments or composite sensations. Aesthetic figures, they tell us, and I quote, take effect on a plane of composition as an image of a universe, a phenomena. The great aesthetic figures of thought and the novel, but also of painting, sculpture and music, produce affects that surpass ordinary affections and perceptions. Figures have nothing to do with resemblance or rhetoric, but are the conditions under which the arts produce affects of stone and metal, of string and wind, of line and colour, on a plane of composition of a universe. There is a demand here, and, and they do make this demand strongly. There is a demand here that requires us to encounter art quite differently than is our usual habit of being in and responding to the world. Where we see resemblance, for example, two men talking in Hockney's picture emphasising stillness, Deleuze and Guattari ask us to consider not what it is, but what are the conditions through which it works. It is a very difficult task for, let, for us to let go of our preconceptions and opinions about art. It is so easy to say, this is a picture of two men being attacked by a leaping leopard. Whilst an image is conceived as a representation of the world, we do remain perfectly safe. What happens, though, when art produces effects of line and colour that surpass ordinary affections and perceptions? What are the conditions that enable us, enable this? David Hockney painted pictures emphasising stillness in 1962. The painting is an asymmetrical composition in which a leopard, a leopard appears to leap from the top right-hand corner of the painting towards the two men in the left-hand lower quadrant. The two men are in deep conversation, oblivious to the impending onslaught. A diagonal line uh, uh, of text separates them from the leaping leopard. The line of the text reads, they are perfectly safe, this is a still. In the right hand quadrant there is a small house-like structure that seems connected to the figures by a discontinuous plane of, of dark colours. In his reflections on this painting, Hockney begins by writing about the work as a narrative. And I, I have an extensive quote now. From a distance, it looks like a leopard leaping on two men who were just having a quiet talk, having taken a walk from a small, little, semi-detached house. It looks strange as if the house, as if the leopard's about to leap on them and eat them, or fight them. And as you walk a little closer to the picture, because you notice a line of type, you read the type first. In this sense, it robs the picture of its magic because you interpret the picture in terms of a written message which says they are perfectly safe. It is a still. You realise the leopard will never reach the men. My intention was to force you to go back and look closely at the canvas itself, and then in that sense it's naughty because it's robbed you of what you were thinking before and you have to look at it in a different way. That was the intention. If you put a real message on a painting, what is meant to be read, it, and it will be read, I began the painting, painting without actually knowing its complete subject. Then I realised that what was odd and attractive about it was that although it looks as though it's full of action, it's a still, a painting cannot have any action. But then I want to return you to Deleuze and Guattari, who, say, who actually talk against intention and look at it a different way. Hockney is determined that while the painting appears full of action, it is in fact a still. A pay says a painting cannot have any action. He believes that the conceit presented in the line of text, they are perfectly safe, this is a still, will bring the viewer to their senses so that they realise that this painting is just a picture. The leopard will never reach the men. 
On the surface, this would seem to make logical sense. In his, pic in his article, Pictures Emphasising Stillness, Alan Wood tells us that Hockney's pictures from the 60s are concerned with their status as pictures. Wood, Wood suggests that Hockney's paintings are still because they are fictions, static images that have no real time of their own. In this sense, he argues, they are different from photographs. Unlike a still carved from reality, picture emphasising stillness is a diagram of an action that will never happen. In employing the materiality of paint and the artificiality of the conventions of painting, Hockney demonstrates that a picture is not a window on the world, it is an object in the world. According to an aesthetic regime where paintings exist as objects to be viewed by human subjects, compositional dynamism may be seen to operate purely within the frame of the work. Again, we are perfectly safe since it is only an image. However, for Deleuze, the function of painting is not representational, if, it, if by that we mean a snapshot of the world. Furthermore, the event of painting is always more than just an image. Its task is not to illustrate the world, nor is it merely concerned with telling a narrative or story of the world. The common problem for painting, as all art, observes Deleuze, is that it is, that it is never a matter of reproducing or inventing forms, but rather a question of capturing forces. Thus, the object of the painting is to paint the abstract play of forces. In casting a net over chaos, painting enacts the resting of the percept from the perception and affect from affection. Through this athleticism, painting dissolves forms and creates a zone in which the subject and object plane of material and plane of composition are imperceptible. Figured this way, a confrontation with the forces of chaos of painting is not for the faint-hearted. Here we may return to Hockney's picture emphasising stillness. In contradiction to Hockney, I, I would suggest it is not just a still. We feel the force and the weight of the leaping leopard and its attendants, the splashes and shapes of paint. We become entangled with the, with the leopard, it, the kind of priority of size, become vectors endowed with force and weight in the flight towards the two men, who form a stable and unseemingly and seemingly un immovable block. The line of text becomes a defence shield the line of text becomes a defence field and we become caught up in the dynamics as the line deflects us into space. So basically what I'm saying is that we are actually as the leopard, this, I mean, this, if you think of billi billiard playing billiards, that in the sense we, because of that small line of text, we actually become deflected back into space uh, as we get caught up. We may be interrupted in this action, as Hockney suggests, make a counterpoint movement towards the painting. So we might then, you know, actually come up to the painting, make a counterpoint, encounter the words as readable text and actually read them. However, as we move in and out, we become caught up in the pictorial possibilities of this painting. The, this block of sensation plays out. The two figures are no longer just men who are, have wandered up from the little house and are having a chat. Together they become an inseparable, uh, become inseparable, conjoining as a solid impenetrable square. The top right corner of this square becomes a fulcrum on which the line of text, they are perfectly safe, this is a still, precariously balances, working as a counterpoint to the forces produced by the leaping leopard and its attendants. For argument's sake, let us make some mischief to test, uh, let us make some, some, let us engage in some mischief making to test the sensational effect of meeting of such forces. And I think, you know, that kind of idea of us just sitting like that, well, Yes, I'm telling you, but do you, you know, is that something that, that works for you? So let's test it. 
What, for example, if we were actually to move, remove the line of text? Would, if we, what if we were to remove the line of text that initially is, is really the, def the, the defence field? Do, um, would we come crashing down? Would the leopard come sliding down um, if we were to, to use that? Um, would we come cr crashing to the ground, knock the house down, knock the men down, what would happen? What on the other hand, if... Okay. All right, so, and what if we took out the little house in the corner? Uh, uh, would the block dissolve and the two men fall out of the picture plane, pushed by the force of the leopard and the attendant, the shapes? Or would the momentum be dissipated and, and the shapes slip and slide down the, so the side and dissolve into an ineffectual, ineffectual puddle, bringing us to an ignominious halt? So just coming back. So just going back. Sorry. Dan. Okay. Okay. Just so going back again. So just as we as we go through that act of taking that away, what happens? Does that fall if we come back and and remove? Well, going the wrong way. Sorry, you get. We move the house. Is that just? Is the weight just then push the men over? Does the whole that? A work of uh, forces in. So coming to try test again, uh, another, because the, the drawings that Hockney, Hockney did in the 60s were, I think, the kind of most radical drawings that really pushed drawing to an end. So taking uh, his Leaping Leopard of 1960s, and we say, okay, well, these look like little marks, marks that perhaps have nothing to do with the drawing. But the question I would ask again, what if we... What if we lose them? What just starts to happen? The whole image starts to float and lose its any sort of gravitas. So the, how the, the marks work in it. A third image, Leaping Letter, 1962. Again, it, we start to see a leopard. Is it on the same plane or, or what is it? We have these scratchy little marks, these little marks at the bottom. What happens if we remove these marks? Does, does the leopard knock over um, the sitting boy? And that, again, we start to see about the boy not as a boy, as a, as a representation, but as a shape uh, and a, a confrontation of forces. Take this a little further. I want to go back to... Um, Toulouse Lautrec, um, Cirque Fernando, the ringmaster, and want you to pay. So, in within this this grand composition, we we enter via the ringmaster. We become whizzed around uh, around the, the composition. But do we keep going, or do actually does the figure does the figure on the left actually turn to bring us? And actually, we become engulfed in the cycling round and round and round of the ringmaster. If we remove him, the, the little jester, we actually, what happens? Um, do we actually, in, in removing him, do we actually go round and round or do we go whizzing off? Just by actually playing around with this, the, we become uh, uh, aware of the attendant forces that operate in, in an image. And finally, El Lissitzky's beat the, the whites with a red wedge. What if, for example, what if we lose that? We have, in, in the initial one, we have this incredible force of the red triangle. If we move that, we just get stuck in a block. The question is, is this, somebody says, is this about meaning? Or does this actually affect us 
bodily in how we, what is it? Is it a conceptual seek or is it a material effect on, uh, in our engagement with, with the image? Okay, uh, now I want to say, okay, we have in this that idea of text and image. How does the text work in this? And it's paying attention to the top one on the left and this one down here. What if we shift those? What power does that triangle then have within, within that dynamism? Does the triangle actually retain its force as to, or does it lose its momentum and dissipate, dissipate and float and hover in comparison to where we have that? So the word, the, the text operating as text but also as a force and effect within the image. So... Let me return to Hockney for a moment and pull this together. Deleuze and Guattari propose that there is a pictorial possibility that has nothing to do with physical possibility and that endows the most acrobatic postures with a sense of balance. Standing up alone does not mean having a top or a bottom or even being upright. Um, for even houses are drunk and askew. It is only the act by which the compound of created sensation is preserved in, its in itself. Hockney's picture emphasising stillness offers precisely this sort of possibility. It is peopled by an entire visualised geometry. As an object in the world, this painting offers a place where the plane of material rises up and becomes indistinguishable from the plane of composition. It is a block of percepts and affects composed of differential speeds and vectors. Paintings are not just spatial, they are counterpoint of motion. Paintings are not spa just spatialized, uh, yet yeah, they, are, they are counterpoints of motion. The experience of emphasizing, uh, pictures emphasizing stillness affects us and enables us to glimpse the forces beneath perception, affection and especially opinion. Through this analysis, I've, I hope I've demonstrated that the forces operating in pictures emphasising stillness undermine its representational qualities uh, and even its object qualities and question its status as a still. The leopard is no longer a leopard, but rather is a shape with force, direction and weight and in league with the surrounding patches of paint become vectors cutting a swathe as and through the image. In the meantime, however, the conceptual sense activated by the, activated by the line of text, they're perfectly safe, this is a still, confronts the sensations produced by the forces operating in the picture. The confrontation or interference between the concept and sensation produces an athletic, a, a robust athleticism. In pictures emphasising stillness, concepts and conceptual figures leave the plane of imminence and move amongst sensations and aesthetic figures, whilst conversely, sensations and aesthetic figures leave the plane of composition to mingle on a plane of imminence. It is this interference that produces a deframing that breaks out the image onto an infinite cosmos. It is this athleticism that Deleuze and Guattari suggest offers the possibility of a different figure of thought. And so I return to Motherwell and appropriate, uh, and in this, the current project that I'm going. Okay. The current project, uh, the kind of thinking through this, is something that's become central to, to my thinking of, uh, as a figurative artist. How, I, how uh, the, that kind of dichotomy between abstraction and figuration that is such a... Uh, um, still so entrenched, how does one think beyond that, uh, that uh, kind of oppositional notion that one, that, that, uh, of figuration and abstraction, and yet and think about the abstract forces w that operate within figuration. The current investigation that I'm engaged in is concerned with appropriation and whether, con uh, whether a contemporary practice of appropriation may address the conditions through which images work so as to reinflect the images they draw upon 
and to ask to what degree they might succeed or fail in generating new modes of innovation, subversion or critique. The, the work draws its, its inspiration Um, it draws its inspiration from Robert Motherwell's Elegies to a Spanish Republic and takes the form of figurative drawings and paintings. It includes such works as Black with No Way Out after, Ele uh, after Motherwell and Elegy to an Old Republic. Given the discussion so far, what does it mean to appropriate an image now? What, for example, does it mean to invoke the ghost of Robert Motherwell in a figurative work? What are the ghosts in the work and how might one attend to them and, to cite Derrida, give them back their voice and allow them to speak? Between 1949 and 1991, Robert Motherwell painted more than 170 abstract works that constitute what is now known to us as the elegies to, a Spanish, to the Spanish Republic. Central yeah, a central to, sorry, there's some of them. Um, central to this work will be um, to Reconciliation Elegy, a work painted in 19, 77, and I seem to have misplaced it, so I'll just go on. Um, which com was commissioned for the East Building of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Of the painting, Motherwell says, the Washington painting was re entitled Reconciliation Elegy for several reasons. Partly from a conversation the same year with Spanish artist Tapiz about the hopes for a new humanism in Spain. My elegies to the Spanish Republic have been meant on one level as an elegy for the tragically missed opportunity of Spain to enter the liberal world in the 1930s and for its tragic suffering then and four decades after. Reconciliation elegy points back to specific ent events in history, the Spanish Civil War. Historically, Picasso's Guernica which deals with the bombing of Guernica by Ita German and Italian warplanes at the behest of the Spanish Nationalist Force in 1937, is seen as the most powerful anti-war painting of the 20th century in the way that it captures and expresses the horror of war. The power of Motherwell's elegy paintings, on the other hand, were nullified, were nullified by the discourse of abstract expression and Cold War politics Abstract expressionism is the art of free America and the reduction of abstract expressionism to mute abstract shapes that are purely abstract. This remaining reading remains alive and well. In his review of the current show of Robert Motherwell at National Gallery of Art, Christopher Allen talks about the questionable claim to meaning made by the Elegy series which is intended to recall the Spanish Civil War. Allen find, struggles to find meaning in the work, suggesting, for example, in his lithograph, one senses a certain frustration that abstract gestural marks are ultimately gratuitous and can never have the depth of meaning of calligraphy, and that his work is trying to mean more than it can. In Allen's assessment, Motherwell's abstract shapes become reduced to mutinous and this, is, and this offers no ex access to the viewer. But what if the elegies were not just about meaning, but rather about evoking effect and sensation? Here I would return to Deleuze and Guattari's argument that art is concerned with sensation rather than meaning or representation and that art's task is to summon forth the invisible forces uh, and to make imperceptible the imperceptible forces that populate the world. Perhaps this enables us to think differently about Mother's World's work and, it, and the appropriation it inspires. So I return to my earlier question. What does it mean to invoke the ghost uh, of Robert Motherwell in a series of figurative images? 
Surely it is not just a question of invoking the name and history of Robert Motherwell, nor is it just a question of a technical application of Motherwell's compositions. We must not forget um, that for Motherwell, all of the elegies speak of a terrible death that must not be forgotten. While specifically they may refer to the Spanish tragedy, as Carmian points out, we should not fix them in this time and place. Reconciliation has multiple meanings. Reconciliation of the Spanish people, reconciliation with life and death. The reconciliation elegy is not less for Spain, but also for all humankind. In his 2007 article, Living with Ghosts, From Appropriation to Invocation in Contemporary Art, Jan, Jan Voet argues that the task in contemporary appropriation is, and I quote, to approach ghosts in such a way as to do justice to their complex nature. Learn to live with ghosts. Learn how to let them speak or give them back their speech. In order, to, in order to do that, he says, we need to acknowledge the performative dimension of language, the realisation of the performative power of words and images, the acknowledgement that they do not only signify, but they produce manifest, manifest effects and affects in the world. Um, this realisation has, if taken uh, seriously, and I guess that that's the question, a question, is it a question of belief, has a critical impact on how we think and practice our imaging. And for Voerwit, this also means to understand the responsibility that comes with speaking to engage in the procedures of speech and face the consequences of what's being said. So if your images actually have real effects in the world and real effects, then you have a responsibility for the effects that they have. That's uh, the position that he takes and I think I take. Thus, he suggests that the aim of appropriation can no longer be analysis alone. And staging an, appropriate, uh, an object appropriation can no longer be contained in a moment of mere contemplation. Rather, he says, appropriation requires an active negotiation to accommodate the ghost. Art must concern itself more with the practicalities and material gestures performed in the ceremony of invocation. In other words, it is not enough to reference Motherwell through the linguistic sign after Motherwell. To invoke Motherwell's elegies for a Spanish Republic involves acknowledging the conditions through which the elegies work and putting, the work, putting to work the expansive and compressive forces in the work in order to undo the image and to attempt to, make, to produce something true to life. And so in that, that idea of an invocation and the shift from the idea of appropriation to invocation, um, that a shift from uh, questions of meaning to questions of effect and the expansive force becomes important. And so in that, it, I think in the project, I, initially I started off with um, some sense of um, some sense of it, but it's much more recently that that question and concern with effect becomes important. How do you evoke the effect? Now, interestingly, coming back, and I want to just come back in the, and coming to the conclusion, that the first um, painting that Motherwell ever did, made in this series, was called At Five in the Afternoon. Um, and, of course, that then refers us back to Collins Street, 5 p.m., uh, and, and, uh, and uh, certainly the work that I've done on um, Burke Street, 5 p.m., and then to Elegy for an Oz Republic. The question, of course, of the success of such w of image is always that question, but that is the kind of the, the, the ongoing project that I, I um, am engaged in. So now I want just to come to a conclusion. In any picture, we need to consider not what it is, but what are the conditions through which it works. Whilst an image is conceived as a representation of the world, we do remain safe. However, if we get beneath the 
if we get beneath the representation and act the performative image, power of imaging so that the massing black shapes weigh on us, the pressure and tension of the masses push and shove, uh, pressure and shove, we may be raised from our law so that we must, may just be able to, and I quote, invoke the ghosts of undisclosed histories in a way that allows them to appear as ghosts and reveal the nature of an ambiguous presence. And through this, we may just come in touch and even glimpse the force between perception, affection, and especially opinion. This is when one is able to produce something true to life. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That was a fantastic um, presentation and certainly lots to ponder. I have um, a lot of um, dots to join. Um, Deborah is a <laughs> wonderful sceptic. So um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I'll take questions from the floor. Actually, where's our mic? Okay, Barb. Barbara? I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, because I've, I've never actually been in the presence of the painting. You know, and I mean, I think that's what we're always dealing with when we're, when we're dealing with images uh, of, uh, of a work. Um, and, and I think that certainly, um, I suppose my, my focus more on, on those, those what happens in, in the picture and, and talking about those forces and effects was because I'm, you know, was dealing with that, the kind of representation rather than actually being able to deal with the material presence. But I think one of the things that I would, you know, that the kind of the idea of that the material that rises imperceptibly and, and, and that is the, the material, and I would say in the drawing and painting, when you're dealing with the material fact, is it's it's how that material erupts through, and that is very much in addition. So you have the kind of the dynamics of forces and effects, but then you have the irritation of the material presence of the materiality of charcoal or um, paint. That that is a disruptive, uh, you know, that's the disruptive force. That is harder to talk about in when we're dealing with representations on a screen. But yes, I, I, it does change. It does make a, a different argument, but not an, but an argument I think that, that supports, um, support, supports a kind of materialist reading of, of that. And, and I was quite aware that I can't deal with the material unless we have a, a, the material thing here. One of our limits, isn't it? Can that address? 
Nettie. Relationships when parents are always, um, I guess, it starts with sometimes they're, they're not, sometimes they're. And she just said, I painted a decline. So as soon as you get this idea of painting a decline or an image of decline, Bob evacuates of it of any possibilities of doing anything. And so I came to this realism and wanted to reinvent um, this and reinvestigate what it is that the material practice does, both into the materiality of of the, the materials itself, but also in terms of how, how you know, I am interested in composition, the way that things work and w uh, don't work, uh, and our lack of literacy in that. And, and so, you know, what is it? How can we then talk about them again? Tourism came and found me. Was that it, it was a discourse, I suppose, that allowed me to go back and like, to investigate these questions. And in a sense, it goes back, you know, you'll say, oh, well, it goes back to Sandy. Well, uh, you know, it, it, that the, 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 the materialism not going back to a problematic way. But you have to draw. What can we draw from? Enable me to really critic and allow me to move forward. It doesn't mean to say I have to throw out a practice. It means. 
means that I can actually work with them. And, and this kind of mother world project, I can see now, going back to that kind of re re reconciliation, at least I haven't started working with, I can see that this is a project that will last, probably last Okay, we have time for one more question, Oliver, and then we have to stick to our very tight schedule. <laughs> no, please. Yes. go back to the, the Heideggerian, you know, the, the making of the silver chalice, you know, that uh, two things, uh, the idea of indebtedness uh, and co-responsibility, that we are indebted, you know, that, you know, say the silver chalice is, was, as Heidegger says, the silver chalice was indebted to the silver, it was indebted to the idea, you know, so it's, it, it, and then the idea becomes as material, in a sense, as the silver, and indebted to the kind of the use for which something is made. So the, the kind of idea of indigenous and the making of, of and the emergence of art, I think is, is a way, in, instead of going back to this idea of intention, because we all know that, uh, how often you see somebody's work and they say, oh, my intention is that. You think, how did they get that? It doesn't really have there any relationship because the intention Thank, Thank you, you very much, Barbara.